the person who has something to say is Erdogan. Um, mm-hmm. Because, sure, he doesn't have to get the customs union. If he can't get the customs union, he's just going to increase trade with Russia, with other countries from the Middle East. And so at the end of the day, the bigger stick in this game is once again on Turkey's side. Hello, my name is Nicholas Furnival. You are watching or listening to an OSW interview. Today, I'm talking to Adam Michalski from OSW's Turkey Department. We'll be discussing Turkey's foreign policy. Hi, Adam. Hi. We're talking a little today about the big changes in Turkey, the big change meaning 20 years of Erdogan's rule continuing. And we want to focus on foreign policy. In fact, in this area, there have been some changes because there is a new foreign minister. Well, uh, to some extent, uh, there is maybe a slight change in the, the opening stages of this government when it took over and uh, when, when the new cabinet was appointed middle of this year uh, in the sense that we've seen Turkey try to reapproach the West with some form of a positive agenda mm-hmm. perhaps we could recall the Vilnius summit where Erdogan said that you know he's going to try to ratify Sweden's membership uh, and essentially send that down to the parliament which he actually has done mm-hmm. um, now unfortunately is kind of stuck but I mean this was a first kind of positive signal that uh, that Erdogan was going to do something positive. At the same time, during the summit, the the Vilnius summit, the president of Turkey has also mentioned that he wanted to restart uh, discussions on Turkey's accession into the EU and also talk about other economic uh, aspects of this discussion, primarily concentrating on the customs union, on the visa liberalization. Those are two things that Turkey really wants from the EU. And at this stage, they still haven't got them. I mean, they have a customs union an old one since 1995, but they wanted to, of course, have it kind of uh, modernized uh, to include other goods. So those were things that uh, sent this weird message after quite some time of turmoil between Turkey and the West, that Turkey was willing to well, re-energize its relations uh, with, with, with the EU, uh, with the United States, and perhaps find a new way to kind of s- talk about contentious topics, but at the same time find new channels of communication, cooperation, which definitely sent a positive vibe, uh, I think, across uh, the West, mm-hmm. pointing out that Turkey was definitely experiencing some form of a shift. But at the same time, I feel that while we have observed these small type of shifts, the general picture is that Turkey is more or less in the same place where it has been with its relations with that bloc. I mean, um, since I've been talking about the EU, I mean, sure, the EU might have re-engaged with Turkey discussing, you know, the accession topics. It's still very critical when it comes to Ankara's stance with regards to some of its regional uh, conflicts, particularly with Greece, even though mm-hmm. I will briefly say that the relations between Ankara uh, and Athens has been improved significantly over the last couple of months. Mm -hmm. That doesn't change the fact that there is still the Cyprus issue, that there is still the maritime borders issue, uh, that there is still the energy resource issue where, you know, two states are competing for for, for these things. So there's a thousand things and a thousand problems with Turkey-EU relations, which are, I think, problematic on the level of structural kind of conflicts, which I think neither Turkey or EU uh, hopes that they will be resolved. But Nonetheless, dialogue has been restarted between, I think, both sides. And I think that this is the slight change that we haven't seen last year, because last year there was practically no EU in Turkish foreign policy. And I think right now this is the radical kind of change of tone. But that, as I said, that doesn't change the fact that there are dozens of conflicts of interests, of regional uh, issues that I think divide both of these blocks. And I think that they're going to be definitely visible next year, but hopefully some of them might be resolved. When it comes to the United States, well, I'd say that these relations are very much stagnant at this stage. I mean, Mm -hmm. the big topic was the sale of F-16 jets to Turkey, which was attached to uh, Turkey ratifying Sweden's membership. But as I've said, I mean, since Turkey still hasn't ratified Sweden's membership, at the same time, Congress doesn't feel the pressure to, you know, the need to sell Turkey F-16 jets. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the impasse that we had Last year is the same impasse that we're facing right now at the same at the moment as we're discussing. So there hasn't been really much improvement. I'd say that even perhaps there has been even a reverse. 
uh, for a negative. Uh, that has to do with the situation in the Middle East, particularly the war between Hamas and Israel. This has been a very contentious issue. And another point that I think distances Turkey from uh, not only the United States, but in general, the West. I mean, Turkey supports Hamas. Sure, for a brief moment, it called for mediation between Israel and Hamas. But right now, it's taken a very firm kind of pro-Hamas, pro-Arab look at the conflict, which is the contrary to what the West has been uh, doing, supporting Israel uh, and kind of also trying to mediate, but I think definitely far more supportive of Israel than what Turkey is. And this is one of those new conflicts or wedges that has the potential to rip apart or perhaps shift Turkey further away from, you know, its kind of pro-Western uh, approach when it comes to, in general, foreign policy. I mean, let's remember Turkey is a member, member of NATO and its mm-hmm. security and political priorities still lie within the Western Bloc, but the Middle East crisis is causing a further rupture and a kind of further distancing of both both of these sides, particularly the United States and, 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 and Turkey from, you know, their probable uh, aspects of cooperation. Mm-hmm. So the picture we get so far is Turkey is a NATO member. It's aspiring to join the European Union. It seems to be in the Western world. And yet we have these issues between Israel and Hamas. It seems at the very least that Turkey is a very assertive member of NATO and potentially Europe. How is Turkey so assertive? Where does its strength come from? Well, I'd say that Turkey has something that you could call as positive power, positive influence and negative influence. And I'd say that I start with this idea of negative influence is that Turkey has a lot of bargaining power when it Mm -hmm. comes to its discussions with the West, right? Um, As I mentioned, the Swedish, Swedish case is the most prime example of this, right? Turkey can block the accession of Sweden. And as a result, expect that in return for, you know, Turkey greenlighting it sometime in the future, it receives some type of a benefit from the United States. For example, it wants the F-16s. From NATO, it wants further concentration on the topic of terrorism, particularly Kurdish terrorism, which it feels, which Ankara feels is neglected, neglected by the West and mm-hmm. not necessarily understood uh, correctly. Uh, and at the same time, you know, it can discipline Sweden to, you know, tighten its anti-terror laws, particularly that Sweden is a hotspot when it comes for, you know, Kurdish refugees uh, or people, asylum seekers who actually flee Turkey. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, Turkey would want Sweden to be more politically aligned with uh, Turkey's way of dealing with these people, perhaps not necessarily as strict, but they definitely want cooperation from Sweden. So when Turkey feels that there is some group of people who are working against Turkish interests, it would like to have cooperation from Sweden. And Sweden has been doing a lot of things to, you know, to fulfill the demands that Turkey has been placing. But going back to this whole idea, this is what I call this type of negative influence that Turkey has. I mean, in the sense that by blocking Sweden's membership, it can and extract a lot of, you know, uh, benefits from the West and, and, mm-hmm. and see whether it can, you know, achieve some type of compromises that normally it wouldn't do. So this has to do with, I think, Turkey's fundamental position for the West as both a partner and at the same time a kind of rival that, you know, has its own political uh, agenda that doesn't necessarily align. And as a result, we see Turkey trying to, you know, push the boundaries of whether it can force the West to cooperate more alongside the demands that Turkey has or whether Whether, you know, it has to concede, you know, some form of political defeat and, you know, align with the West. But as now, for as of now, I see that Turkey is very um, effectively using its position, international position, to really set on the Western agenda its priorities. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the same thing goes, I think, for the European Union. Sure, in in this position, Erdogan actually wants something for the European Union, right? He wants the customs union modernization, which would allow for uh, the addition of additional, uh, for the addition of services and other goods that are right now excluded from the current uh, customs union to be included in the new one. Mm -hmm. Uh, And this would, of course, boost the Turkish economy, which, uh, as we all know, is still having troubles when it comes to its its financial situation. Uh, The visa liberalization is very important because that's the free movement of people, of labor, Mm-hmm. Uh, this is the potential for the you know Turkish diaspora to move freely between you know one country and another. That also is tied to some form of you know cash flow and and and, and human capital flow between the, these two blocks. And so that is something that definitely Turkey wants. But, but you know, how, how is it bargaining with Europe? What does it have to offer? Just as much as Turkey wants something, 
from 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 the European Union. The European Union would, for example, want to restart the discussions on, uh, for example, um, the new migration uh, deal. I mean, we had a migration deal uh, with Turkey signed, I think, in 2016, mm-hmm. but it has expired in 2021. And right now, the migration, migrant flow, refugee flow is essentially unregulated. However, there are no big problems uh, related to this because the refugee flow right now is stemming more from Northern Africa and not going from the Turkey route. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean that in the future we might have another Syrian conflict issue or something happening that's going to force people to flee through Turkey. And so, for example, the European Union uh, wants to engage with Ankara and, um, you know, get a new refugee deal, a new migration deal um, uh, signed so that they can prevent uh, in the future any type of uh, problems, especially that when migration continues to be a big topic and a big topic on the agenda of many European countries, particularly Germany, which is, I think, experiencing a quite rapid rise of refugees and asylum seekers. So there are things that European Union wants from Turkey. And I think that the EU is an example. The EU-Turkey relations are an example of both, you know, Erdogan wanting something, the European Union wanting something, but at the end of the day, the person who has something to say is Erdogan. Um, Mm -hmm. Because, sure, he doesn't have to get the customs union. If he can't get the customs union, he's just going to increase trade with Russia, with other countries from the Middle East. If he can't get the visa liberalization, well, then he's going to search for other alternatives with other partners to, you know, increase the flow of human capital. And so at the end of the day, and this is something that, once again, I keep on highlighting, is that I think that the bigger stick in this game is, once again, on Turkey's side. And Mm -hmm. this is something that I think Turkey can use against the European Union to, you know, say that, you know, if you don't want to cooperate with us, that's your loss, right? So we will just move on and do something else. Mm -hmm. And so this is what I keep on saying that I think that the the ones who are, uh, that Turkey continues to be the player who has the most, um, I think, effective foreign policy when it comes to extracting concessions and, you know, engaging with its Western partners in a way that it brings benefits to Ankara. And I think that we'll see where these relations between Turkey and the EU go. Uh, I think that they're going to certainly, these discussions are going to be very tough because it's not like the European Union wants to suddenly give all its cards to Turkey that Turkey wants Mm -hmm. and get very little uh, uh, benefit back from that. So I think that the European Union also understands that it's not just about, you know, giving what Erdogan wants and then getting the migration deal signed because that's the most important thing. Uh, I think that maybe they would want to also get some economic concessions, for example, like have Turkey limit its trade with Russia, particularly when it comes to microprocessors and anything that aids uh, Russia's war efforts, which Turkey, well, this isn't official, uh, but I mean, sources say that Turkey is one of the bigger partners when it comes to the transit of these goods. Mm -hmm. Sanctions by a lot of Western countries, which Turkey, of course, can do because it's not part of a sanctions of a sanctions regime. Mm-hmm. But I mean, it would be good if Turkey could stop. So those are additional things that Europe might get from engaging with Erdogan. But this is also something that, you know, it isn't an easy bargain. And at the end of the day, as I keep on mentioning, it's Erdogan who can say whether this deal suits him or not. And if it doesn't suit him, it's going to be the European Union's loss, not Erdogan's loss. Mm-hmm. Erdogan is fantastic when it comes to finding alternative partners and alternative ways of feeling of filling in gaps or uh, of finding other solutions that you know he can find with other partners and you know negotiate with other partners so yeah I mean the the, the main point is that uh, I think that we sometimes underestimate uh, Turkey's ability to uh, maneuver in this very complex field of relations of grievances of amity and enmity patterns and essentially put uh, create a foreign policy that fundamentally essentially secures Turkish interests in such a way that I think last year was very much, this year essentially was a very good example of Turkey using this position, its critical position as a partner of the EU, of the United States, and at the same time a competitor who wants, who has different points of view and wants to extract different things. Would you say this is the the best way of describing Turkey as a competitor? Because there have been many countries that have attempted to balance between the EU and Russia and they tend to get sucked too closely into Russia, but Turkey seems to be able to remain assertive towards Russia. 
when I was talking about these amity amity patterns uh, of these elements of cooperation and competition, I'm trying to show that Turkey can be both a partner and, of course, uh, a troublemaker to some mm-hmm. extent, if you want to call it this way, uh, for the West. But that same logic applies also for Turkey's uh, eastern partners, mm-hmm. uh, broadly speaking. I mean, we're talking about Russia, but we're talking also about the Middle East. Ankara is willing to cooperate economically, increase trade, uh, invest in energy resources, particularly the nuclear power plant in Akkuya, which Russia is building uh, in Turkey. That's areas of cooperation and very uh, seen in the West, of course, is very suspicious. You know, how is it that Russia is building a nuclear plant in a state that's essentially a part of NATO? Uh, not to mention that the nuclear plant is very close to the United States uh, Air Force Base in Injerlik. So, mm-hmm. you know, that also creates friction. Uh, but Turkey is willing to, you know, increase that partnership. It's willing to work with Putin. It's willing to speak with that regime. Those are some things that uh, definitely one would label Turkey as being, you know, pro-Russian. But at the same time, it's willing to, you know, put its sticks in the gears and the knobs of, of, of the Russian uh, political machine, uh, signifying its own uh, interests. And I think, you know, again, the gas trade is something very interesting because Turkey has proposed cooperation with Russia to build a massive gas hub where it could send Russian gas and possibly other resources uh, from other states through its country uh, to Europe or to other markets. And, you know, this is something that Turkey, that President Erdogan and Putin have agreed on. But at the same time, the newest messages that are coming from this uh, investment show that Turkey is not necessarily willing to submit to Russian demands. I mean, sure, it's willing to take Russian gas, but it's willing to take Russian gas on the condition that it's sold as part of a larger kind of hub where it, you know, has uh, other countries contributing to Mm -hmm. this hub. So it's not just Russian gas, because maybe let me clarify, Russia wanted this hub to be exclusive to its Mm -hmm. own market. And this is something that Turkey said, no, you know, if we want to do a hub, we're going to make an international hub and you can invest in that hub you can you know help us secure the resources to build it but you're not going to be exclusive and so here we see turkey placing its own demands and being able to be assertive with when it comes to its relations with russia syria is once again i think the best example of, of this kind of assertiveness i mean Yes, both of these partners, uh, both of these countries are partners in this region in the sense that uh, they're engaged in the Syrian civil war. They, to some extent, have to cooperate over there when it comes to its militaries. I mean, Russia controls uh, the air force and essentially everything that's happening in the skies. Turkey uh, uh, has its uh, troops on the ground in northern Syria and it controls, you know, the areas. There is some cooperation taking place in order to, you know, mitigate any form of, you know, um, escalation and keeping this Syrian civil war at a, you know, a simmer so that it doesn't, you know, explode once again. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, this is a point of great friction because both of these countries have slightly different interests. I mean, Turkey would want to end the Syrian civil war, have Bashar al-Assad either removed or, you know, kind of re-engaged with uh, some type of a positive uh, discussion with with, with the Turks. At the same time, uh, Moscow is also willing to engage in these discussions, but it doesn't want to uh, leave Assad alone. It doesn't want to make, it doesn't want to um, allow Syria to, for example, uh, accept uh, the fact that Turkey has its troops present in the northern part of the country. Mm-hmm. I mean, Assad wants to essentially have Turks uh, leave uh, his, 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 his state, uh, but this is something that Turkey cannot accept. And, you know, Russia, on the other hand, has to kind of, you know, realizes that it cannot give up on Assad and suddenly, you know, give in to Turkish demands because this would undermine its interests. Mm-hmm. I mean, let's understand that, you know, Russia also has its military base uh, in Syria. It has its military presence. Bashar al-Assad is one of the few friends that Russia has nowadays in the national system. So once again, you know, Russia cannot change its support for Assad. At the same time, Turkey cannot change its policy towards Syria and just suddenly disappear from from the northern parts of the country, remove its forces like as if, you know, nothing has ever happened. So we see conflicting uh, for interests. For reasons of prestige or for reasons of well, for, for No, for, for uh, this is maybe I would add, for reasons of particularly security. I mean, mm-hmm. Turkey is afraid 
afraid and still very much considers the Kurdish threat in Syria to be very much real, uh, particularly northeastern Syria, where there where mm, there is a lot of Kurds supported paradoxically by the United States, which Turkey considers to be terrorists, an extension of the PKK, which in Turkey is a terrorist group. Uh, and, and so it sees its involvement in northern Syria, particularly with its military as a belt, kind of blocking off uh, Turkey and Syria and creating this corridor of, 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 of you know, military engagement where no terrorist is able to cross or any type of terrorist activity is eliminated, thus creating more security inside the country. Could I ask again about the situation in Nagorno-Karabakh? Because it almost seems like Turkey's new backyard, but it was for a very long time Russia's backyard. Is it normal that there wasn't more of a conflict, uh, more stress between Russia and Turkey? Uh, around this conflict? This is a conflict that's consistently changing in front of our eyes. I mean, I think a couple of months ago, I would have easily said that uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh wars and the consistent and the following conflicts which came after that has essentially shifted the balance of power where essentially it's Azerbaijan and Turkey setting up their new regional order uh, with Armenia having to essentially sign every type of document that Turkey and Azerbaijan releases because they are the ones defeated in this mm-hmm. uh, whole uh, situation. But I mean, we also see that Nagorno-Karabakh shouldn't necessarily be seen only from the perspective of Turkey, uh, you know, conducting its foreign policy in this region and removing Russia. I mean, Russia is still, as, as many people point out, a fundamental partner to, 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 to the Caucasus and to its regional stability. Uh, this has to do with, I think, a paradox in the sense, if you look at it from um, Azerbaijan's point of view, Azerbaijan for decades has essentially been forced to speak to the Kremlin when it came to the Nagorno-Karabakh issue. The same goes for Armenia. And as a result, this conflict has, go, has gone on for decades and decades. Sure, right now, Turkey has replaced Kremlin's place and suddenly the Nagorno-Karabakh has pretty much disappeared. Well, mm-hmm. not disappeared, but uh, it, it's been very much settled on pro-Azeri uh, terms. But at the same time, Azerbaijan comes to realize that uh, essentially it has replaced Moscow with Ankara. And so you've replaced one big brother with another big brother, which is right now dictating you of how you're going to conduct your foreign policy. And so this in Azerbaijan is creating, a, I think, a different perspective. Sure, Turkey was very helpful and is still a fundamental uh, partner when it comes to uh, the Caucasus uh, and in general settling uh, the disputes over there. But it, Russia cannot be forgotten because Russia is still a very good balance to also Turkish dominance in this region. Mm-hmm. And I think that uh, at the same time, if both Turkey and Russia can be present in this region uh, and agree on the terms of the new peace, which of course favor Azerbaijan, then this region will be even more stable. So I think that paradoxically, you have to answer this question not from Turkey's point of view, but from Azerbaijan's point Mm -hmm. of view, which is very cleverly calculating that it cannot exclude just Russia because Russia is always going to try to in some way or another meddle in this conflict. So if you can include Russia in a way that satisfies also Russia, then you you have a much more bigger probability that peace will prevail uh, in this region in a way that, of course, right now favors Turkey and Azerbaijan. So, so I think uh, without giving Turkey the hegemony over this region. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so I think that these are the calculations that are taking place. We also see the European Union right now becoming engaged with their uh, monitoring missions when it comes to this region. So a very interesting dynamic is taking place and uh, we'll see how that develops. But um, I would be the last person to say that, you know, the conflict has been settled, that Oz Azerbaijan and Turkey have essentially uh, sealed everything over there and it's on their terms that uh, this conflict will be settled. And as I've said, that has to do with the fact that I think other states in this region have also slightly different agendas to Turkey. Mm -hmm. And as a result, this might be the factor that could potentially shift things a little bit. But I wouldn't expect that, you know, the current status quo, the current balance of power would suddenly stop favoring Turkey. I think that this has been settled. Maybe we could get back to the Arab world, the Middle East. What direction is Turkish foreign policy moving in in that area? Well, as a bit of context, I'd say that um, this year and the following years before, uh, we've seen Turkey conduct a pretty massive regional reset. Uh, That is, of course, up to the Hamas-Israel war. And what we've seen up until that time was Turkey uh, essentially reestablishing its political and economic relations with the Gulf states, with which 
was largely in conflict due to the Arab Spring and the thousands of little issues that came after that. So that was kind of extinguished, and we've seen this this kind of rejuvenation of these relations with economic trade suddenly, you know, going through the roof between those countries and Turkey. Uh, we've seen very similar steps when it came to Israel, which actually I think paradoxically was one of the first, the very first states which Turkey started to uh, reset its relations. They reappointed their ambassadors after you know many years of, of a lack of you know contact on this level. Mm-hmm. Uh, they rejuvenated their economic uh, relations, uh, their tourist relations, which was something you know that that, that 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 came up over there. So another point of discussion was that Turkey and Israel were thinking about you know increasing their energy cooperation. Mm-hmm. Uh, Israel has a lot of gas uh, in its part of the the, the sea that it controls with the seabed, uh, and Turkey was willing to perhaps you know uh, go into a joint venture with some of Israeli companies to extract this gas. And so this was something that was painting an image that, you know, these Turkey-Israeli relations were suddenly, you know, completely reset. And we were talking about perhaps one of the better partnerships, you know, growing Mm -hmm. over there. And something similar happened also with Egypt, although on a much different level where uh, Turkish president met with Egyptian president for the first time in like a decade uh, since the start of of, of, of this, of the Arab Arab Spring. Uh, And there were discussions again of reappointing ambassadors, which I think were reappointed, if I'm correct, uh, of, again, restoring political ties, economic ties. So the whole region in general, prior to the Hamas-Israeli war, is un- was undergoing a full reset, which wasn't only Turkish, Turkish, Turkey's initiative. It was the initiative of a whole region, which just saw an mm-hmm. opportunity to extinguish old conflicts and just start cooperating and, you know, having uh, as much benefits as one could get from a, a positive and stable uh, environment. But... The Hamas-Israeli war has, I think, radically reshaped this region in the sense that it has divided the world into the pro-Palestinian world and the pro-Israeli world, with, Mm -hmm. of course, the pro-Israeli world being only the Western world that's supporting it. And essentially not the rest, including Turkey. not including Turkey, exactly, with essentially Turkey and the rest of the Middle East becoming very much pro-Palestinian. And so what that has created is that now Turkish and Israeli relations are, you know, essentially they don't exist, I would say, on a political level. On an economic level, sure, they're still, you know, trading. But, I mean, politically, whatever has been achieved over the last two, three years of the reset taking place has essentially been wiped out. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we don't know how these relations are going to develop uh, in the future. Uh, At the same time, uh, we see that the conflict... uh, between Hamas and Israel is drawing in a lot of Western attention. One of the paradoxes is that for the last couple of years, the Middle East didn't have much of, you know, Western uh, involvement taking place in this region. And suddenly, Mm -hmm. the Israeli-Hamas war brings a lot of, you know, U.S. military to the Mediterranean Sea, a lot of engagement. You know, the Western states are supplying munitions to Israel. uh, And so suddenly, you see the West kind of going back at least to the Israel part of the Middle East conflict uh, and kind of becoming once again engaged at least one foot into this whole war that's taking place between Hamas and Israel. And that's definitely negative because the more there is of the United States, the less there is place or room, headroom for the Middle East to conduct foreign policy and and con- and, and manage this region on their own terms, mm-hmm. right? Because the United States also set its own conditions and that for the last decades has always been destructive. I mean, Iraq, uh, as we all recall, has been uh, funded fundamental cause of a lot of these grievances between Mm -hmm. the United States and this region. So I think at this stage, the Middle East is very much still in the early stages of kind of this reshuffle. I think that Turkey, when it comes to its relations with Arab states, particularly the Gulf countries with Egypt, I think that these relations are still going to continue very much untouched. But at the same time, its relations with Israel are going to continue on deteriorating and at the same time having a negative impact on Turkey's relations with the West, which we don't know what type of other long-term consequences this might create. But if we might sum this up in a kind of very short way, the Middle East from being kind of an oasis of uh, stability over the last, I think, paradoxically over the last year, has suddenly turned once again to this arena of competition of great powers, of regional powers, and of division, necess- mm-hmm. rather than necessarily, you know, unity and cooperation. So that's nothing negative for Turkey, and that's something negative for the region itself. And we are still to see how this will develop uh, over the next year. So I wanted to ask a closing question, which is connected to stability. There's a lot of talk about Turkey becoming more authoritarian. 
authoritarian countries very often domestic policy forces them to have an aggressive foreign policy. Should we expect Turkey to be a force for stability or one which causes problems for the international arena? I'd say that uh, Turkey is going to be a force for Turkey and Turkish interests. Mm -hmm. uh, whether these interests are aligned more with West or aligned more with whatever Turkey feels uh, is more important, that's going to be dictating the kind of environment in which we're going to be able to assess whether you know Turkish foreign policy is is more constructive or more destructive when it comes to you know its relations with its particular partners. I mean, I'd say that uh, at this stage, um, Erdogan has very much consolidated power inside the country. He has no competition. Essentially, his vision of Turkey has been accepted by the public to, to the Turkey that's essentially autonomous, great, uh, conducting its own foreign policy without looking to Washington, to Brussels, or to Moscow, but just doing what it does uh, considers to be the best thing in its own national interest. And at the same time, we also see a Turkey that is still very much bound into these very weird relations with the West, with the European Union, particularly economically, with Russia, and so uh, and the Middle East, of course. And so I think that what will dictate the direction that Turkish foreign policy takes depends on how, how each of these relations will you know turn out to be in the next couple of months. I mean, if we will see a positive uh, turn in Turkey relations where, for example, there will be more discussions uh, on Turkey's accession, perhaps not with the goal of having Turkey in the EU, but perhaps discussing, you know, the customs union uh, in addition to the accession. For example, if there will be some movement, positive movement along these lines, then Turkey might very well say that, you know, perhaps we should cooperate more with Brussels, more with Washington, because we're definitely getting more benefits from there than we're getting from Russia. Mm -hmm. And then we will be discussing, we'll be talking about how Turkey is suddenly pivoting a little bit more to the West. But we should not be expecting that Turkey is suddenly going to be jumping ship from, you know, its pro-Turkish path to a pro-Western path. And, you know, mm -hmm. so this is something that's excluded. I think that this is gone. The fact that Erdogan has once again secured his foreign policy only cements the idea that, you know, Turkey follows its own autonomous path. And when it sees an opportunity that it, ben that it benefits itself, it will go down that path. And that path, as I've mentioned, might be pro-Western, but it suddenly might also be turning out to be more pro-Russian because, I mean, you know, if the West isn't willing to cooperate with Turkey to, you know, perhaps give something in return, uh, and Turkey doesn't want to then give, you know, Swedish accession up because, you know, this would be too much of a bargaining card that it would lose, then, you know, it might start to look at other alternatives. And Russia, as I said, is one of the bigger partners for Turkey, as I said, for energy cooperation, for political cooperation. As I said, you know, they have this conflict in Syria going on in Nagorno-Karabakh. So if they can find some type of, you know, middle ground on these issues, then it suddenly might come out that for Ankara, Moscow is a much better partner. Uh, and we're going to be talking about how Turkey is suddenly becoming Moscow's, you know, best friend. Mm -hmm. And I think the same thing goes for the Middle East, although here, as I've said, is a, we have a very big question mark of where everything is going to get, go. But certainly the Middle East has become one of the few cornerstones of Turkish foreign policy, in part because the Middle East and the Gulf countries are you know, very rich. Turkey needs uh, their capital and their investments. And I think that regardless of what happens, Turkey is going to be eyeballing any type of other options to increase trade with them, increase economic cooperation, at the same time, political cooperation. And now taking these three sets of puzzle, you know, Turkey and the West, Turkey and Russia, Turkey and the Middle East, I mean, which direction this is going to go really brings itself down to the incentives that Turkey is going to have positioned in, in front of itself. If it has more incentive on one side than on the other side, then obviously it will choose that option. Uh, but at the same time, let's keep in mind that, you know, regardless of, I think, how much Turkish foreign policy might distance itself sometimes from the West, it's still anchored by NATO, by its trade with the EU, which is definitely going to be, to some extent, constraining the scale and the ability of Turkey to completely, for example, uh, see, sever its ties with the West. So I think that mm -hmm. Turkey in this way is always bound with the West, but paradoxically, it's also very autonomous. Definitely a country worth keeping an eye on then. And we'll see what 2024 brings. Thank you, Adam. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching this OSW interview. If you enjoyed it, why don't you check out our extensive archive for more analysis on the region.